Let's roll. <laughs> Good morning, class. I'm going to give you the safety lecture on using the equipment in this shop and any other shop you might have the pleasure to use. This is a general uh, disclaimer. <coughs> So no, you've been notified of rules and regulations and how to handle power equipment and tools. So I'm going to go through this list of uh, procedures first. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me during the presentation. All right. When working with machines that cut, drill, saw, and grind, wear proper apparel for the job. Number two goes into that into detail. Don't come in with wristwatches, necklaces, bracelets, gloves, anything that can be caught in a machine. Long sleeves, uh, belts. Sweaters tied around your neck, anything that can catch in a drill press, any type of a saw or rotating machine that can pull you straight in the machine, it'll scalp you, it'll break your neck, it'll do whatever it wants to do to you first before it's finished. All right, long hair, be sure you have your hair tied up in a hat some way so it can't get caught in a machine. Number three talks about the shoes. In here, we don't require safety toed, steel toed boots, but don't wear flip flops in here or anything. Closed shoes, tennis shoes, sneakers. But the best way to go in here. There's a lot of stuff on the floor, on the tables that, that can fall and injure your toes quite easily, so be careful. Don't operate any equipment in this shop or any other shop unless you're wearing safety glasses, all right? I put them on over my prescription glasses. I don't depend on these glasses for protection. They're not designed for that. We provide the glasses for you. They're in a bucket on the counter over there. It says safety glasses. Wear them. They're there for your use. I replace them every term or so, so they're clean. All right. Don't number five says don't use hand tools or power tools or anything till safe and proper use is fully understood. I'm not giving you shop 101 class in here. This is the basic overview of what these machines can do, what they can't do. They're very strong uh, industrial powered tools with very powerful motors. They don't know when to stop cutting. They don't know the difference between you or a piece of wood. They don't care. They just cut. That's all they're designed to do. Okay. So keep that in mind when you're ever using a piece of equipment. Don't use anything unless you know what you're doing with it. We're not expecting you to understand every piece of equipment off the bat. Okay. Number six says don't use tools. Use tools for only the purpose they're designed. Any other use of tools is dangerous. All right. <clears throat> Number seven goes into safety devices and guards on the machines. They're there for your protection. We don't remove anything to operate a machine. And, and uh, I'll show you that as we go around the studio when we get to the, the tool tour. All right, number eight talks about adjustments and fasteners. Don't do anything to a machine while it's running. If you have to change the height of the blade or whatever, turn the machine off, make sure it stops before you do anything of that nature. Number nine talks about special setups. That's if you have to clamp something into a machine to hold it. If you can't hold it with your hand, there's a way to do it safely and properly. And uh, Buckley and I have been doing this for 30 years in here and around different studios, so we, we know a lot of tricks on how to set things up, and uh, that's what we do. If you have any questions about anything, ask us, and that's what we're here for you. Uh, number 10 goes into uh, routine operations, maintenance, and such. Uh, that's our job. We don't provide any tools that are unsafe. The most unsafe saw is a saw with a dull blade. If you're cutting something and, and the machine's making all kind of horrible noises and racket and smoke's coming out of it and sparks, Something's wrong, the blade's dull, there's something wrong. So stop, turn the machine off, and we'll come and figure out what's wrong with it, all right? <clears throat> we do all the maintenance on the machines, that's not your job. Number 11 talks about wrenches or tools. Don't put anything on or near a machine when it's in operation because the machine might vibrate, and whatever you have sitting on it, your pencil, your pen, your ruler, can vibrate into the blade and come out as a projectile. Okay, page two, number 12. Great care should be taken to should be sure that all lumber is free of nails, sand, paint, loose knots, etc. Anything you pull out of the dumpster to use on a saw, be sure there's no nails or screws or staples or anything foreign in the wood that when the blade hits it, it's either going to break the blade, that'll fly out, or the screw or nail will fly out. It's not going to hit you, it'll hit the poor guy sitting across the room minding his own business. So be sure whatever you're using doesn't have anything that's going to be a safety hazard in that regard. 13 talks about safety lines. We have some lines around areas. Uh, the best thing to do is some, somebody's using a machine, stay away from them, okay? <laughs> they may look like they know what they're doing, but possibility too, they may not. So their ignorance on, a, on running a certain machine might be uh, 
a danger to you. Stay away from people that are using machines. Don't talk to them while they're using a machine. Don't interrupt anybody while they're using a machine. Extension cords, we use the roll down cord from the ceiling in here usually. If we have to use a cord in a site, we make sure it's not on the floor. That's going to be a tripping hazard. Make sure it's not dangling across the room where somebody can trip and fall on it. Number 15 talks about lighting. Be sure we have the lights on when we're working in the studios. No seances in the dark, no candlelight operations going on, whatever. Okay, number 16 talks about uh, protective covers on tools. Most of the things we have don't have protective covers. If you're carrying a hatchet or a machete around or something or a pocket knife, be sure that you have a sheath on it. Don't stick the knife in your pocket especially like a utility knife, be sure you retract the blade before you put it in your pocket. You cut yourself pretty seriously that way. 17 talks about personal tools. If you want to bring your own stuff in, fine. Just make sure that, that you show it to one of us and that we determine that it's safe because whatever comes in here, we're basically responsible for, even if it's your tool. All right. Any questions on the first part of the handout? Good. Okay. Equipment use and follow through. Number one, do not start or stop a machine for another person. If you're using a machine, you turn it on, you use it. When you're finished with it, you turn it off. Make sure it stops moving or revolving before you walk away from it. Some of these tools coast rather silently when they're just shut off initially, so be sure that the thing is stopped moving before you walk away from it. So the next person coming up to use it won't have a problem. It's going to be really busy in here in the next few weeks. There's 25 or so of you and it's going to be noisy and people are going to be in a hurry and don't, don't rush to do anything, okay? Don't come in here mad or on, under the influence of anything, prescribed or non-prescribed, whatever. These tools don't like when you're impaired or inebriated. You read on your medicine bottle for your prescription, it says do not operate heavy equipment. This is heavy equipment in here, folks, and it doesn't know when to stop cutting. So keep that in mind. Leave your aggressions outside the door. Don't try to get aggressive with the equipment because it'll get twice as aggressive back with you. Okay. <clears throat> Number two, stay out of line of all revolving blades and wheels. That's basic common knowledge. Number three talks about be especially around moving parts, flywheels, gears, and drive belts. We don't have any exposed flywheel gears or drive belts in the studio and its equipment. Things are contained in safety guards. The drill presses have belts that move around the top of them. They're enclosed in a case, so don't change anything while the machine's running, like try and change the speed on a drill press or whatever. Turn the machine off, then we can do it the proper safe way. Number four talks about stock. Whatever you're cutting is stock. Don't force it into the machine faster than it'll take it. As, as I mentioned earlier, the machines are strong and powerful, but they do have limitations. And if you're trying to cut something that uh, the machine doesn't like, it'll let you know. Different woods are harder than other woods. There's maple and oak and, and uh, hard wood, and, and it'll cut a lot tougher than a, a soft piece of wood. Okay, so we have to be sure not to force anything into a machine faster than it will take it. Number six, don't distract the attention of those using machines. I mentioned that previously. 110% attention when you're operating a piece of power equipment. All right. No smoking in the building or anywhere on campus. Number seven, never leave a machine running. Always make sure the machine stopped when you walk away from it. I'll show you that when I show you how to work the tools. Okay, page three. Keep the machine in its surrounding workspace clean. It's a, not a huge room. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff. So don't complicate it by leaving garbage in here. Throw it in the garbage can. They throw it out in the morning when the custodians come in. We don't want to be working knee deep in, in junk and sawdust and everything else. So we have to keep stuff swept up. That's your job to help us keep this place clean. All right. Number nine talks about if a tool's uh, not in use, put it back where you found it. That way the next guy will know where it is. Everything goes in a place. Don't leave tools outside in the rain. Don't leave tools anywhere that uh, they shouldn't be. Right. Number 11 talks about material storage. There again, it's a small place. There's a lot of stuff. We do the best we can. 
just don't leave anything where somebody can trip and fall over it or it can be knocked over and, and fall on your head off of a shelf. Okay. Number 12 talks about uh, spilled oil, grease, or any other liquid. The floor is slippery if it gets wet, so if you spill something, wipe it up. There's paper towels, there's a mop around the corner, brooms, all this. You've been here a month or two, so you at least know what's going on in here. Sweep up whatever you have so nobody else is going to get hurt on it. Number 13, that's kind of old school stuff. Uh, don't wash your hands or arms in gasoline. <laughs> People used to do that back when I was a kid. You know, <laughs> but you get grease on your hand, put some gasoline and wipe it like that, and boom, it'll blow up in your hand because of the low flash point of gasoline and friction will ignite it. So we have soap, we have other things to get grease and, and other dirty things off your hands. Okay. Additional information. Anybody have questions on the uh, handout so far? No? Good. Limited spray painting in the shop. Well, basically no spray painting in the shop. If you're going to spray paint, do it outside. Okay. It's just too much in here and that fumes will overcome everybody, so we don't want that to happen. Same goes if you're using contact cement or anything that has a, a high odor. It's not good. Not good for you. So do anything like that outside. Compressed air, I'll go show you some compressed air tools that we have in the shop and how to operate a compressed air tool. All right. Number three talks about general points to keep in mind when carrying materials. We have hand trucks everywhere. There's one there, one there. We've got a forklift. We've got cranes to lift things. Don't bend over at the waist and pick up a 100-pound bag of plastic. You're going to be in the chiropractor for the rest of your life if you do that. Use the strong leg muscles, bend down at your knees to pick things up, unless your knees are bad. But, or get somebody to help you do it, whatever. Just don't, try not to hurt your back. You're still young, once you get older like me, then you hurt your back and it's a non-stop problem. And never goes away, all right? Number four talks about climbing on things. If it's necessary to climb on things, we have one, two, three ladders I'm looking at over there. Don't stand on one of these stools like this and try and work up on the ceiling because the stool's going to spin out, you're going to fall, you're going to break your arm, and we're going to have all kinds of problems. So where, use a ladder if you're climbing in any of these studios, not just in here, the painting room, the drawing room, everybody, every room has a ladder for that <coughs> specific area, and they're good ladders. We don't put rickety old wood ones. We have the nice fiberglass ladders for you. All right. Number five talks about fire protection. Okay. What's the first thing you do in case of a fire in this building? Run for the door. Okay. Get the hell out of here. Don't save whatever you're working on. Go ahead and get out. That's all we can tell you. If you have presence of mind to pull the fire alarm, great. You know, there's a fire extinguisher at every exit. Designed for the purpose they're designed for. They're ma regularly maintained, but it's not your job to be a fireman or a fire person. It's your job to save yourself. Get out of the building. Get out this door or go out. There's an exit through the two exits out the back of the building. Okay. Another thing, like uh, if you're working in here by yourself at night, let somebody know you're here. Okay. Your friend or somebody say, I'm working at FIU tonight. So if you get overcome by something and whatever, you go down, they would come in and find you here in the morning. So at least let somebody know where you are, what you're doing. If you have any type of accident or any issue in here, if you're nervous at night, youth fair is going to be going on in a few days. A lot of strange people around the area that aren't normally here call FIU Public Safety, the number 75911. It's written on the door, it's written by the phone, it's written everywhere. We put that on there because if you take your cell phone and you dial 911 and get Metro Police, they're not gonna know where you are you say, I'm in the sculpture studio at FIU. Where's that? So you call that number, that goes straight to FIU police. Then they dispatch the fire rescue. They dispatch the police car out here if you need help that quick. Okay? And they, they're here in a gym. They, they love nothing more than turn the sirens and come run. Okay? <laughs> so, by all means, 75911 if there's any incident. Okay? Hopefully there won't be, but you never know. Okay, I talked about the fire stuff, a uh, little bit of things here, keep only, uh, the C talks about small quantities of flammable liquids. Uh, we've got flammable storage cabinets, 
that we keep all this stuff in as a as a regular base on a regular basis. Uh, don't wear oil or, or gasoline or soak clothing with mineral spirits, anything like that. A spark can ignite yourself and then you're on fire. All right? So we don't want to do that. Sawdust and wood shavings are extreme fire hazards. We have these big machines. There's one that says band saws. These suck the dust out of the room when we're, or out of the machine when we're using the machines. They're very noisy and uh, I won't use them during this little talk today just because we won't be able to hear myself speak on the camera. But they're here to soak up, the, to pick up the dust. If you have uh, any respiratory problems, be sure we have, I have boxes of dust masks. I, I'll give, give them to you as many as you want. I don't care how many you use a day, I'll give them to you. Found out a thing that we won't be able to do that too long because uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, it's a uh, a governing regulation for shops of this nature has instituted instituted a new law where it's, we're not going to be able to use these anymore. If a student uses one of these, he's going to be required to go to respiratory training, and he also has to have a, a fit test, a, a pulmonary test, to be sure that your lungs are in good shape. That's so you can't come back later with a, maybe you had a pre-existing condition or whatever and say, "Well, I got this from breathing stuff, and they made me wear this dust mask," and so you know. So it's going, to be the, it's going to be a tricky situation in the next few months or years to figure out how we're going to work this. One thing is to just avoid using materials that that's really going to be a requirement to wear. A, a dust mask like this doesn't protect you from paint fumes or anything toxic of that nature. These are just cheapo, general, peak dust out of your long things, you know. So the other thing that we can do is to help with that is if you make some sawdust, sweep it up, get it in the garbage can. try and fix everything and somebody else goes around behind you and messes it up. Anyway, uh, greasy oily rags, it's on this little handout here. We have a little canister to put those things so they, they're not spontaneous combustion hazard. As a, it says no smoking in the studio, no smoking anywhere on campus. It's a smoke-free campus now. Number uh, H talks about electrical wiring that's frayed or shorted. If you see a problem with anything, show it to myself or Professor Buckley. We'll take care of it. Okay. Here comes one. On the back page of this little handout, you see big letters, and it says, Warning. Do not dispose chemicals or solvents of any kind, including clay and plaster in the sink or storm drains at any time. Use a proper safe container for this purpose. You've already been through that with your plaster projects. Everything goes into these drums. And what we're trying to do is keep this stuff out of the water table, which is just a few feet below the uh, ground here. There. Somebody will come up and hang on the floor. Anyway. This is your, your health, your children's health, your grandchildren's health we're trying to watch out for by not contaminating our water tables. We don't put anything down these sinks, no paint, no anything other than washing your hands and, and anything that's water-based, okay? No oil-based or solvents go into the sinks or the storm drains. That's very, very important. So, any questions on any of this stuff? No. And I'm doing my job very, very well. All right. Now, we're going to proceed on, and I'm going to give you, you can stay where you are. Don't move. I'm going to give you a brief, uh, you're going to be doing this project, and you're going to be going to Home Depot or wherever you want to go get your wood. If you've never gone to Home Depot or never gone to get wood, then it's going to be an education for you when you get to the store. It's uh, <laughs> daunting at best. There's a lot of different kind of wood. For this project, you're going to be using mostly what we call uh, white wood. It's uh, those shelves up on the wall up there. Those are good examples of white wood. Those are that's about a one by eight or a one by ten, eight feet long. You don't need to get them that long. You can buy shorter lengths of it. Okay. The main thing you need to be careful on a piece of wood you buy like that, that it's not warped, going like this, or it's not 
bowed or curved, you look at the board and it looks like a, a saucer you're going to eat food out of. It's round, you know. You want it flat because we're going to be machining it on these machines. You want the thing flat. You don't want it warped. You might buy it there and bring it home and put it in your car and it warps two days later. That's because there's a lot of moisture in the wood. Try and pick out something good, all right, when you're buying it. You might just pay a dollar or two more for the board to get something that doesn't have a lot of knots in it. Like this. That, 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 that knot. That's where the branch came off of this thing when it was a tree. And if we're trying to cut circles out of it or holes, that, that knot is very hard. And if we hit that with the saw blade or the drill bit, the big drill bit, it's going to fly out of there and be loose and, and it's going to be a big mess. Okay. So you want to try and get good wood. This is a piece of, this is lumber. This is one solid piece of wood, how it came out of the tree. This is a two by four. You can still see the growth rings on it, like so. It has a definite grain, which goes like this. If we cut this, this board this way, we're ripping it, all right? And if we're cutting the board this way, we're cross-cutting it, okay? That's a cross-cut. That's a rip. We have two different machines that do specific operations. This radial saw, which I'll show you shortly, is good for doing cross-cuts, cutting the board this way. This table saw that we have over here is for cutting boards this way. Now, the same operation can be formed on each tool by setting it up a different way. We can pull this out, turn the saw blade around, but it's very dangerous. So we have both tools. If you have your own shop later on, you might only have the, the pleasure of having one or the other. And you'll have to learn how to work it that way. But anyway, that's what we do in here. All right. This is one solid piece of wood, a piece of lumber. This is a piece of MDF. MDF. It stands for medium density fiber board. Do not recommend this for, for buying for your wood project because it's nothing but sawdust and paper glued together. All right, and this stuff, when it gets wet, it'll fall apart. It has no structural strength when you're gluing it together. It, it's, it's junk, but, but <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. This has a purpose. They make furniture out of it. They cover it with laminates and such like that. It used to be particle board with bigger chunks of, of stuff that they assemble it out of. And, and if it gets wet, it falls apart, all right? So this is plywood, small piece. Usually comes four by eight feet, a large sheet. It's multiple layers of wood laminated together under pressure with glue. All right. I don't recommend this for your project either, unless you're making a big box or something where it would be cost prohibitive to buy solid pieces of lumber like something to make a large piece. You can make a, a large flat piece out of plywood, it's fine. Plywood comes in many different grades and, and, and materials that it's made of. This is like cabinet grade wood, they call it. It has, a, I don't know, it's probably a oak on the surface. There's cheaper wood on the inside, but it has a nice outer surface, which is designed for making furniture tables and stuff. When you put it together, it, it looks nice when you finish it on the outside. It always has this, this edge on the inside, so that has to be dealt with if you were going to build something like this and you don't want that, you'd have to cut it on angles and put the pieces together, miter the pieces together. So, when you're going to buy your wood, keep these things in mind. Any questions about wood? Okay. Professor Buckle will give you more information on how much wood you're going to need for the, the particular project. All right, I'm going to start talking about the machines. I'm going to go over here to the bandsaw behind me. Okay, this is a bandsaw. The reason it's called a bandsaw is because it has a 12 foot 6 inch metal band inside that has teeth on it. It's like these hanging on the wall. These are used blades. You go to any butcher shop, they have the same machine sitting there that they use to cut up the cows and the goats and the pigs and the chicken and the fish and the shrimp or whatever. They run it right through the saw, cuts through bones, cuts through meat, cuts through everything. I'm telling you that because it will cut through your fingers, your thumbs, your arm, your hand, everything, just like it will the meat you buy at the grocery store. Okay. The only difference is their saw is a little cleaner than this one. But we could clean this one up and use it for the same thing. All right. So don't ever forget that. Never forget where your little thumbs are when you're using a machine like this. Okay. If you're cutting a piece of material this thick, we'd never have that much blade exposed. 
this this device on here, this guide and, and guard, is, is designed to keep the blade enclosed when it's cutting, and it also keeps the blade from moving. The blade's flexible, it has bearings, so we can keep this guide or guard about a half an inch or quarter of an inch above what you're cutting, so you can see what you're doing. You don't want it so low, to, so low it's going to, you can't see it, or so high it's going to be dangerous to have that much blade exposed. When we're using it, we lock this down like so. I'll turn this on for a second just to show you what it does. This is uh of MDF. I'm just going to make some basic little cuts just to show you what I'm talking about. This is what the machine sounds like when it's on. Now the machine's off. The machine's still coasting. All right. You can still hurt yourself on it. You can still cut your finger off. It's still moving. There, it finally just stopped this now. So be sure that machine is stopped before you do any adjustments with this, this guide. You can get your fingers in here into where the blade is if this thing's moving at all. If you're trying to adjust this up and down. So be sure the machine is not on when you're adjusting it, as we said in the handout. Make sure all fasteners are secured before you start or stop the machine. Okay. It cuts very smooth, very quick. All right. It has limitations because the blade is flexible. Okay. If you try and cut too tight of a curve with it, the blade's going to bend around and you're going to hear a noise. Okay. I can safely make a curved cut, but only so tight of a range. That. We have other ways to cut tighter curves, different machines with a different type of blade. Okay. You get to the point where. don't want to get your thumbs close to the piece that you're using. I have a small block of wood like this. I can use another piece of wood to push it through the blade like so. Never reach in there and flick it with your fingers. That's where you're going to flick the blade and flick the end off your finger. So you use what you're pushing the wood through to knock it out of the way. Simple like that. During the course of this project, this machine and this machine will be used a lot. You're going to be lined up six feet, cutting teeth and gears and such. Don't be in a hurry. Don't let the person behind you intimidate you. Take your turn. Do what you got to do. Relax. Be diligent. Paying attention to what you're doing. Don't relax so much you become complacent. But get your job done. Get finished. Get out. Let the next guy come in. All right. Nobody's in a hurry. You've got what two or three, three weeks. I don't know how long it will be the tournament. Don't let it wait until the the last week before the project's due to come in here and do everything. You're going to have a hard time. Plenty of time. You can do what you have to. Do. If you get stuck on the machine and, and you can't get out, meaning you're cutting something long, and deep, like so you can always back up. The blade will go back. There's no teeth on the back of the blade, but you can come out. That's especially if you have to remove a lot of, uh, like an interior. Cut something like that. Just 
the table turns 45 degrees this way for cutting angles on pieces also. So, any questions on the bandsaw? As I mentioned before, this has a flexible blade, meaning it's good for doing curvy cuts and, and, and wavy cuts. This isn't really made for doing perfectly straight cuts on things. You can draw a line, and with practice you can learn to cut it straight. All right? But for perfectly straight cuts, we use a rigid blade saw, such as the radial saw or the table saw. They have a rigid circular blade that's thick, okay? And it doesn't bend like this blade flexes and bends. You go into a knot, one of those hard pieces in the wood, like I showed you with this blade, it'll, it'll go off to the side, okay? So what I'm saying is use this for doing your curvy cuts. When we're finished with the saw, we always put the guide back down and lock this back into place like so. Don't stand here and whack this with your hand. You'll get carpal tunnel syndrome for doing it for a number of years from banging on this thing, constant aggravation and injury to one spot. If it gets stuck and you can't move it, use a piece of wood to move it out of the way. It'll knock it. Never hit it with a hammer. We never hit these any tools with a metal tool, a hammer or a wrench or anything. Use a block of wood, okay? All right, we're going to move over here to the radial saws in this shop. This radial arm saw and the table saw are the most dangerous, the most vicious, the most insidious pieces of equipment. They don't know when to stop setting. They're extremely powerful and dangerous. The hand on the wall, that's our visual element to show you what can happen if things go bad. That's a real hand. This one is is a real hand, but it's made out of plaster. It's a plaster hand. This is a real honest-to-God hand on some guy's arm that didn't make it, you know. So put that there so every time you turn this machine on, you see it and you think about it. Okay, don't let this happen to me. Concentrating on, on what you're doing. This machine has a 10-inch metal blade on it with 60 or 80 teeth, whatever we put on it, rotates carbon fiber or carbon uh, steel tips welded to it. This is the type of saw I'm talking about where a nail or a screw or anything that's in the board, if it hits that blade, either that nail or screw is going to come out of here or the tooth is going to come off the blade and it's going to go somewhere. All right, so there's a guard on here to prevent that from happening, but things happen. When something goes bad, it goes bad really fast. All right. This machine slides. The machine itself, it comes out, it moves with the with your arm, it goes through the wood, the whole machine moves. Okay. This machine, the wood moves through the machine through the machine. The, the, the saw does the saw doesn't move. What you're cutting goes through the saw. So there's different actions and physical things that, that happen when, when you're cutting with both of these tools. The first thing I do before doing anything with any machine, if I come into here or go to any other place to work or whatever, I check the machine out first that it's safe, nothing's messed up, all right? I don't know who used this thing last, who was here yesterday on the weekend. They might have messed it up. I come in here and just turn it on, hit the switch, and boom, I could easily lose my hand without even putting a wood in the thing. Why? Because this whole machine goes up and down. There's a, a, a handle down here that says up. If I crank it this way, the whole saw comes up. If I crank it the other way, it goes down. Somebody maybe might have had a bunch of wood stacked up on here that you're not supposed to do, cutting really thick stuff. And when they cranked it back down, if they weren't paying attention to what they were doing and didn't care about the next person coming in, very easily they could have brought it down. So the blade itself is touching the, the table. All right. And if you can see as I move it now, the blade doesn't move because it's raised up just enough where it's not touching the table. There is a groove cut in the table right here, and that's normal, that's what happens. This is expendable, it, it, it goes away, we replace it when it gets so chopped up, it, it's not good anymore. But that blade has to go through the table to go through what you're cutting. Okay, the blade has to go all the way through what you're cutting. Now here's where the problem happens, is if the blade is touching the table, as soon as I turn the machine on, this thing's going to come out here like a rocket, all right? Because it's driving, it, the blade's grabbing the table, boom, out it comes. If I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, I'm playing around here, and I see, have my hands here, there goes my thumb, there goes whatever, all right? So I first make sure the machine's not touching the table, all right? When you're operating this machine, 
never for any any reason on this earth put your hand behind it okay nothing's ever cut behind the blade it's always in front of the blade All right. make sure that there's nothing on this table there's a little bit of sawdust here a pile of sawdust or a screw or a chunk of wood anything will make your cut wrong because whatever you're cutting has to sit flush against this piece of wood this thing this is the fence that keeps the wood straight keeps it in position if it's not up against there flat the board's going to be out a little bit and you're going to get a curve an angle a bad cut all right so be sure the thing's clean nothing back here that can get caught in the machine none of this chicken wire and stuff that's been around here will come in and it'll be chicken wire and stuff around here you turn it on the blade hits it it's a projectile all right I'm going to cut a, a, a slice through this 2 by 4 I hold my hand down tightly here, not too close to the blade, about a foot away at least. I want to make sure my hand's on here. I turn it on. Make sure it's running smooth. It's like a golf swing you follow through with it. I'm not a golf through the material and push it all right now I haven't moved it you'll notice there's a it's not quite an eighth of an inch it's the width of that saw blade that's been cut there so that's it there's nothing there anymore that's where the saw just just came from so that presents a problem some saws have a wider blade an eighth of an inch or so every time you cut you're going to lose that much of uh, of wood on your piece that you're cutting so say this piece of wood is, is, is 24 inches long exact and I want two 12 inch pieces of wood out of it, I'm not going to get it because when I make the cut, it's going to lose that eighth of an inch in there. Got it? That's the width of the saw blade, so you have to allow for that when you're cutting. And, and the projects you're doing need some degree of precision to make them right, so they're, they have some craftsmanship to them, and so you're going to have to allow for those saw cuts. As you're buying materials, you think, well, I'm going to need a board to cut the four sides, and boom, boom you're going to lose some wood from saw cuts. All right. This is something you'll have to engineer into your project. So, any questions about the radial arm saw? And as we mentioned before, we're not just going to turn you loose and you, here, you got to do this without knowing. We're going to be here. We're going to work for you. Professor Buffy and I are helping you get this thing done. You're going to understand it because you're going to see the processes and everything else. And you're going to have plenty to do. You've got to design it. Don't come to me asking, how many gears do I need? That's your job. My job, I'm in here to help you get this thing made and so you can see things done, processes, and operation of tools and equipment. Okay. Any questions? <coughs> so okay. All right, this is our table saw in this facility here. It has, a, the, a, just like on the radial saw, another 10 inch circular blade. I'll show you the blade. Let's see. Yeah. It's, one. it's inside this little protective covering which is a joke. This thing is not a protective covering. It, it, it professes to be, but it's not. It's just a, the way they build the saws. It's a false sense of security. Don't think that this thing is safe by any means because of this, all right? Okay, this big blade's in here. It's hooked up to a big, powerful motor. It's turning towards you. It's trying to throw whatever you're cutting all the way across the room into you. It's trying to do everything it can do to hurt you, okay? It loves to cut wood, but it wants to kill you on the way. So don't ever forget that, all right? If I'm cutting a piece of material, this is a, a sheet of MDF. It's a half an inch thick. I would certainly have the blade no higher than a, a half an inch or so above the material, like so. Put it on the record, and we're in the process of buying a new saw. Okay. They have this brand new saw called a stop saw. I've got some research on it. That uh, it, it has a device inside the machine that has a like a, a, a charge, like a rifle charge or whatever. If you touch that blade with your thumb or anything that conducts electricity, your body conducts electricity. You know, you can. It's it's a because of the moisture in your body, I guess. The blade senses that, it immediately 
fires that charge and blows the blade, the thing holding the blade right down to the bottom of the, it goes bang and the, stuff, the blade drops out. So you can't cut yourself. They, t they call it a hot dog saw. Go on YouTube and look up hot dog saw. And it shows the guy working, it's foul. Touch your finger, boom, down it goes. You're not gonna lose stuff, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, we're gonna get one. I sent the thing to, they're up in Oregon. I sent to them last week. I don't care how much it costs, we're gonna get it. You know, we're gonna buy this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they got one over in uh, the architecture shop. Problem is, every time you blow that blade down, it costs you about 100, 150 bucks for the cartridge to reset the saw. But it saved somebody's finger or thumb or God knows what. Okay. One accident in here. Lady's still alive, still has all her fingers. Graduate student a few years ago. Not paying attention to what she's doing. Runs her, this wasn't on here. She was cutting some, had a setup to cut some big wood. She was making a couch or something. Ran her thumb through the blade this way. Oh. Yeah. And, and she's over here cutting. I'm on the other side doing something and I hear this blood curdling scream. And I see, I'm not gonna say her name, running across the room this way, holding this thumb like this. And I say, oh, great. Let me see it. You know, so she takes her hand off. Never see anything like it, man. I can see right through her thumb, you know. It's all the way down to the base of the nail. But it was like a piece just gone. Like that. I'm looking at it. And then it goes, boom! The blood went everywhere. And then she's like going on the floor. She's going into shock. And, and they actually put it back together. And being, you know, she didn't lose anything. Didn't get into the bone, which was good. Because a bone injury like that, that's where you get gangrene and sort of infections into the bone. The flesh, they can heal. When you get a, an injury like that into the bone, then that's when they have to start amputating so it stops getting problems. So keep that in mind. Keep your hand as far away from this blade as possible. When this machine's working, when this machine's working, keep your hand as far away from that blade as possible. Okay. There's ways, there's things that we have to help implement that to keep our hands as far away from this machine, the blade as possible. This is called a rip fence. This is what the, uh, we used to direct the wood through the machine in a straight line. So you get a perfectly straight cut every time. All right, some people run machines without this, very dangerous, the board can move a little bit. If it gets a little bit off center from that blade, the blade will catch it on the other side and throw the whole thing up in your face. Extremely dangerous. So the rip fence is on here for a purpose, but it creates danger on its own, all right? Rip fences for holding pieces going through straight. There's another device on here for, for putting other types of cuts through here, but we never use this in conjunction with this. One or the other. Never this guide with the rip fence. Okay. Never, 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 never. Okay. I have to think what I'm doing is I'm doing this so I don't hurt myself while I'm doing this too. I'm gonna cut a piece of wood, we'll make it. I need a seven inch piece of wood out of this piece of wood, seven by whatever. So, if I'm gonna do that, I'll set my guide on the rip fence, seven inches, there's a little lever that locks this thing. There's a needle here and a scale here that goes all the way up to 51 inches. You can cut large pieces of material on this saw, okay? And there's a table here, this is here for a purpose. It's a little bit lower than this top of the saw. And this is so when I'm cutting, what I'm cutting will go smoothly onto the table and not flip down and fall on the floor, which can cause problems. There's another table just like this one there. That if I'm cutting a big sheet of four bay or a big sheet of wood by myself, I'll put the other table here, that table there, I'll have the piece of wood out here, and I'll start here and be pushing it through like so. There's ways to handle large material on a machine like this by yourself. It's good to have somebody help you too, but that can get you into problems too. If you're working, trying to cut a piece of wood, and you've got somebody out here holding the edge of it, and you do, the two of you don't move in perfect unison, you're working on a machine. This guy out here, he's not following what he's doing. He moves a little bit, you can't, and then the whole board, it blows up in your face too. So if I'm using a machine, like I prefer to work on it by myself. I don't want to have to trust anybody else to help me get something through a saw unless it's, there's no other way to do it, all right, because you're just asking for trouble. Not that I don't like the other guy, whether, whoever's working, just the way it is, all right, enough of that. Okay, so I'm going to cut this piece of wood. 
make sure there's nothing on the floor, no sawdust, anything I can slip on, falling into the saw, causing grave damage to my body. All right, make sure the cord's not in the way, make sure I don't have my keys or watch or anything. I'll take my watch off. There, do by example. There, okay. I don't have anything that's gonna get caught in this machine, get my pen out of my pocket. I mentioned earlier in the handout, don't never leave a tool on a machine while it's running or anything, except for these they sit right here. These are called push sticks. This is what I'll push this wood through this saw with. Reason being, this space in between here is so small now, I don't want to put my hand in there. I've seen people do it even smaller, and, and they're crazy. You use the push stick. If you have it way, the fence way out here, you're cutting a big sheet, then you can have room to work through the saw, all right, safely. But as this space diminishes, you want to be sure to have your push stick. These are made out of plywood only. When you make these, you can buy them made out of plastic. It has a little hook here. These get cut and used up. I'll make more when these are ready to go. If you cut without the guide on here, if you're cutting smaller things, it's possible to go through the, through the push stick. That's okay, because we throw them away when they get so chopped up you can't use them anymore. It has a hook that hooks the board and I push it through. The reason they're only made out of plywood is because, as I told you, plywood has these different pieces of wood, different grains go in different directions. If this was made out of a solid piece of lumber, like the white wood stuff you're going to buy, it has a grain running. And if I push pressure down on it, like here, it's going to snap right here. If it snaps while I'm using it, what happens to my hand? It goes into the blade. So this is designed for this purpose. They sit right there ready to go. When I'm cutting, I don't have to look for it. I don't have to hunt for it. I don't have to grope around and feel for it. I know right where it is. Okay. I don't put it in here so it's stuck. I'm stuck here. I can't get this out. I'm having a disaster. All right. It's right there. I know where it is, pointing the right direction. It's like a it's a dance moving stuff through the saw. It's everything choreographed. You have to do one thing, move to the next thing, to the next thing. All right. So I'm gonna cut this piece and then with the saw on, and I'll turn it off and show you what I did with the saw off. And you move over. <laughs> reason I'm having you folks move out of the way is I could have a stroke or something while I'm doing this, fall, and whatever's coming through is going to come out of there, it's going to hit you, all right? Uh, now I'm messed up, now you're messed up, we're all messed up. We've had <laughs> stuff come out of this machine and hit those black cabinets. Actually, they used to be gray, the old cabinets. But there were dents in the front of them from stuff going all the way across the room. There's that much pressure. This blade is like a drive wheel on a car. It's turning, it's putting so much pressure on this piece of wood that if it's not held by me going through here, it's going to go, okay? All right, I'm going to turn the saw on. This machine has two, two buttons. It has a start and a stop. The start button's green, red button, stop. It's designed this way, so if I get in trouble while I'm cutting, I can turn it off with my leg and stop the machine while I have the board on here. Things happen. This thing could ride up on top of the blade, and then it goes over the blade, and then it'll get stuck in this piece over here. And then you're there, the thing's running, you don't have any way to do it, you can't let go of it, because if you let go of it, God knows what it's gonna do. So you have to go turn the saw off, okay? And that's what does that. Okay. Now, what I did, there's my seven inch piece of wood. It, it was one piece of wood. So I put it down on the side. Put it on the saw, I turn the machine on. As I'm pushing it through into the blade, sometimes the little guy won't lift you at the top of the blade with your thumb. It's still one piece of wood. Now it's touching the blade now, it's in the blade. So here's, here's where everything goes crazy. I have to keep pressure down on the board because the blade's turning towards me. It wants to lift the board up into my face. So I have to keep pressure down. I have to keep it moving, okay? The only thing I'm watching because I'm, I'm, I'm still scared to death of this. All of you. Professor Buckley's scared to death of this. We're both scared. We've been using them for years, but we still have 10 fingers. 
that work and eyes that work and, and because we're scared to death of it. Don't ever take a, for granted this thing isn't something to be afraid of. You can use it, but it wants to eat you alive. So anyway, I'm pushing the board through now, holding down. As soon as I get the board on the table, it's still one piece except for where it's been cut. That's when I reach over. I don't have to hunt for it. Grab this, push stick, hook it over the edge, pushing, pushing, pushing through. And right there, it's in both pieces are cut. It's separate. Here's where if I let go of that, zing, that's coming out of there. So I don't want to do that. That's why once it's past the blade, I'm not worried about the left side. I push the right side past the saw, pull the left piece out, and then I turn the saw off like so. That's all there is to it. <sighs> now, very important, you have to keep the board straight as it's going through. And the best way to do that, the only thing you want to look at is this corner right here. Boom. This corner, as it, it has to stay flush and flat with this fence. And as long as it's flush and flat with that fence, this piece will follow. Okay? So that's the main thing you got to look out for. So, and the blade turns 45 degrees like that for cutting angles on things. As you do that, things get more complex. There's more pressure on the wood. Things can get stuck. Things can get bent out of whack. It, everything gets complicated when you start cutting angles with one of these round blades. Okay. So any questions about the table saw? Sir? Does that run the wood all the way through? Yes, absolutely. And then we only use the, the little handle on the right side or we use one both sides? No, no, just one side. Um, I'm not following where your line of questioning is taking me, other than the fact that you have to, you, you're cutting this board, you, you, you're thinking you want to just do a partial cut and stop? No, 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 what, what is, what's your thought? And it's a good thought, don't get me wrong. No, no, I just saw you like running it with the... You wondered whether it had to use the push sticks on both, both No, no, just the one side. Inside here. The one that's being cut is being trapped between yeah. the fence and the blade. Between here. You could kick back up. This one, this one's not, not there's nothing holding this side, see? So there's not as much pressure on this board as that. Cool. Good yeah. question. Man, thank you. Um, when you were cutting for seven inches, does that already take in consideration? Like, yeah, the like saw cut. Okay. Yeah. It's set. The, uh, you're, yeah, it's set. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> no, Unless somebody comes in and unscrews it and moves this little thing, it's it's calibrated and set and and it could get bumped i mean but but i check it every now and then you know just a double check and um you can check it now you know here's. no because you for the last one you told us to if you were going to cut a twelve. yeah that one that see that one you're you're making your measurements with a line this one you're setting the machine it's it's preset you can still screw it up. <laughs> I mean, if you don't get that right on seven, it's going to be or whatever. Um, yeah, that's all I can tell you on that. Good question. Good question. Yeah, so to answer your question, the saw cut is already set into the saw. <laughs> cool, huh? When you're finished with the machine, you put the blade back down. Pull the rip fence back over so nobody's going to put their books on it or hit the blade or whatever fall on it. Okay, this machine is, is plugged in with this extension cord, which is a 220 volt extension cord. It'll knock you on your rear end if you do something wrong. In this shop, we have all of these tools locked out by this uh, power panel here, and we shut them off when we're out of here. That means you can't use them unless I'm here, Professor Buckley's here, whatever. That's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's for everybody's safe. All right. If I'm going to, if I'm finished with that saw, I'll turn this off before I unplug this cord over here because of this thing is rickety. And I don't want to have this come apart in my hand as I'm unplugging 220 volts. I'll show you something in the, in the place here. Turn this on. I'm going to turn this machine on. I'll walk around the corner, on the, right around the little corner on the, other side, on the wall. As you go around, there's a gray box, and it says emergency shutoff. Boom. 
and that's in case there's an accident happening. Say somebody's getting mortally wounded by this saw and you've got to turn it off, you can't get near it, boom, the machine's running. You can turn it off from a remote location. So just stay where you are. Kills the power, boom, it's done. So that's for that saw for this machine, no, not this machine, these two band saws. The reason it's not for this machine, this is a, a technical thing, you, you can know about it, doesn't, it won't hurt you. This is a magnetic starter switch, and here to start this machine, there's a, a magnet, electromagnet, and a, a plate, and when you push the button, it actually energizes a solenoid switch, which is, which is an electrical switch, causes the plate to come to, makes the contact, makes the saw come on, all right? When you hit that switch over there, the emergency shutoff, you're interrupting the electrical current going to it. Boom, it automatically shuts off of another switch in this box for safety. This saw doesn't have a mechanic uh, electric. Well, it turned off that whole panel, actually. Yeah, no, wait a minute. Yeah, it did. Okay. Well, different kind of switch, but still, it's on the same circuit as this thing over here. I'm, I'm getting too complicated for it. Anyway. But just trust me, that's what it's designed for, is your safety. To start the whole thing back up, I'm going to make sure I don't turn this one on. Because it'll come back on if I don't have it. Okay. To start the thing back, I have to re-energize this panel. So I have to pull down as hard as I can. And start that button back up. Then everything will work again. It's the safety feature we have in here. It even shipped the air compressor off on there. That's also not only safe for the tools themselves, is this panel too, because this is very high voltage coming in here. These three words mean what they say, danger, high voltage, 220 volts coming out, possibly 400 some volts coming in, very dangerous. A person could, in, in fact, be electrocuted if they're standing in water. This place used to flood, and there'd be water all over, and we'd be playing with this thing. You know? But so they made it so it doesn't flood anymore. It's just nice. They put a thing on the door here for our safety, right? So if somebody's electrocuted, I don't know. Electrocution's a weird thing. You, you're either going to get knocked off the thing you're touching, or you're going to get stuck to it. Person, this goes true anywhere. At home, your dryer, your power panel, whatever, you know. Somebody's getting shocked, you don't know what's gonna happen. You have to get them away from that thing. And, and if you touch them, you're gonna get shocked too. At least this way, you can disable the power coming into this thing, cause horrible things happen. Anyway. Okay, any questions on the table saw and the power panel? We'll keep, we keep this locked out when you need to use tools. I'm a nice guy, if I'm around and if I know you're gonna be working in here, I'll turn the thing on for you, you know, but you know, I'm not here at night and uh, there'll be class time, that's the time to do the bulk of your work because that's when everything's gonna be powered up, everybody will be working on the, on the machines. Okay. All right, a couple more things, sander, drill, and we're pretty well done. has a nice six inch wide, 48 inch long sanding belt on these drums. Machine runs that way, goes away from you. All right. It's very handy for doing flat surfaces of things like so. For using it during the class, we'll have this on, so sucking the sawdust up. Don't ever let your little finger hang over the edge of what you're sanding. It'll get on the, on the machine. Whatever you're sanding, keep it moving on the sander so it doesn't make it wear unevenly, the, the wood you're sanding. Don't ever sand underneath the machine. You put it down here, so throw it in your face. All right? Always stand from the, the drum to that direction. At times, the, the belt will get worn. We'll, we'll go through four or five of these during the course of this project. 
Same thing for band saw blades. They'll probably put 10 blades on the saw throughout the thing. They wear out, and that's what happens because you're cutting wood and stuff. And I buy a whole stockpile, a whole bunch of new blades and belts, so you have safe stuff while we're working. Right here, there's a joint, this little uh, diagonal line here. That's where it's glued together. From time to time, this thing will break. And when it breaks, it's not a horrible going everywhere thing. It's just going to stop turning. All right. So that's the belt, this belt sander, okay? We'll have these uh, dust sucker things working while we're working. Now I have to go over yeah. here, okay? This, this sander is very handy. You're gonna be using it a lot. It uh, has a, a disc that's attached to the metal disc. There's a sandpaper on here. It's attached with a self-adhesive uh, backing. Where it goes on, it rotates, and it goes that direction, which is counterclockwise, turning to the left. The reason I'm showing you that is because there's, there's a center here to the left. That's where you want to work. And it cuts really fast. I mean, it goes right through. Meaning, you put your finger on that, it's going to cut through your finger just like the wood. So we don't want to get our fingers near that disc, okay? I just took two inches off of this by doing that just for a second. This side of the wheel to this side, if you touch it to there, it's going to go whoop. It's going to pick it up in your face. See? It's going to throw all that sawdust in your face. So that's why we work from the center to the left. Okay, simple, easy. Somebody always does it. They're over here and it's, oh, I got my eye. Well, that's why. Okay. When this machine shuts off, there's a little lever you push here, and it stops it because this thing will run on forever if you don't, and it, you can't really. Somebody may not see it's moving, then somebody else comes up and puts their hand on here, and there goes the back half of their skin. So be sure the thing is stopped before you walk away from it, okay? Okay, now I'm going to show you drills and drill presses and some air tools. And we have numerous tools like this in the shop. This is a hand drill with a cord on it. We have the battery one also. This is the same type of tool as this machine, which is a drill press. This is stationary. This machine's portable. You can take this wherever you're working. It's flexible, but it's not precise, all right? The project you'll be doing most likely in this class requires precision on drilling. Everything has to be drilled straight, multiple holes, the same depth and such. We can accomplish that with a drill press a lot better than a hand drill, okay? Because the hand drill, your humanness, being human, you'll move and it won't be perfectly, the holes won't work. And, your machine won't work, all right? But they all have, it's the same theory behind it. This is an air drill, same type of machine, but it's driven by air, all right? It's very small. It's funny, like this is an air tool. These tools do the same purpose, but this one is big, it's clumsy, bulky, has the electric motor. This one it just uses a, a wind turbine inside to do the same function. This one, there's no chance of electrocution because there's no electricity that goes into it, just air. This one, if you're in the water, working in the rain, you'll get wet. Yes, sir? Is that one more powerful than that one? Not really. I mean, it could be. I don't have a... It's not so much power on a drill. You're looking... Well, yeah, you know, you're drilling through steel and big stuff. You need a half inch. You need a big motor. You know, this one, they're, they're both going to have limitations. It, it, this will go 800 RPM. It's relatively slow compared to a drill like this, which is, well, of course, the, the RPM has got junk. Oh, 25, 2,500. So this machine's almost, what, three times as fast as this one, all right? Speed, speed filters into the uh, equation if you're drilling through metal. Then you want a slower drill, going slow, more torque, more power wood you want to maybe go faster so the faster it goes through the quicker it gets through it's not going to burn the wood and make it nasty all right same thing with band saws you know the one over there usually we have set up for metal it has a metal cutting blade on it now and for your class i'll put wood blades on both of them so we can get a lot of work done the metal saw the speed you can speed up slow it down faster for aluminum softer metal slower for steel iron and that sort of thing all right. So yeah, a good question about power. They're, they're putting about, about the same power, I guess, if you put a, whatever you measure horsepower with. <laughs> same power, just different speed and different. Okay. Be careful when you're pulling the drill bits out of these little cases. 
never run your little fingers down the edge of these where the drill bit's cut out because you'll cut yourself in a nice spiral pattern down your finger, two cuts, and it's very sharp and it'll hurt very bad and it's going to take forever to heal. It's like a paper cut to the tenth power. It's really nasty bad. So these things are very, very sharp, especially when they're new. That's why they drill holes so well. So never hold a drill, never pull your fingers down a drill bit, all right? Bad thing to do. Remember, drill bits get hot when they're in, in the machine drilling. So when you're finished drilling something, you want to let the drill bit cool down before you un take it out of the machine and hold it with your finger, or you're going to get a nice burn on your finger. All right? I'm talking to you as if you've never handled tools before. You know, a lot of you have done work with this type of equipment. So you know these things, but some of you don't. All right? Drills, they all have the same device for holding the drill bit into the machine. Three little fingers come together, hold the drill bit. It's called a chuck, all right? This is a chuck, okay? This machine has it. This machine, it's very obvious. You can see what it looks like. The three little fingers back out, and then they come together. And when you get it in, into the machine, you need to be sure that it's between all three in the center, like so, okay? So when it turns, if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you can put it into the side like that and have it off center. Well, this one has round edges that prevent it, but this one doesn't. So if you're not paying attention to what you're doing, you can put it in there like so. And then when you turn the machine on, the thing's going like that, and it's going to cause all kind of havoc when you turn it on. So be sure that it's in the center of the three fingers on the chuck. Also, never, never clamp down onto where the, the drill bit's been cut out. That's weak. This solid part at the top is the strongest part of the drill bit, so you want to clamp it onto there. Make sure that it's in the machine a, a, three, a half to three quarters of an inch, so it's going to be secure and it won't fly out. So I have to make sure it's in there. Okay. This machine has a chuck key. It's on a chain mounted, <clears throat> so you can tighten the drill bit in. If you're not careful what you're doing, there's little teeth on this key. There's teeth on the drill press. When you put the little pin in the hole, if you're not careful, you can easily get your thumb into the... Uh, my pointer. Get your thumb in between the teeth on this key and the teeth here, and you're going to turn it, and your thumb's going to get stuck in there. And when you pull it out, you're going to have what's called a blood blister, and it's a nasty thing that will last about three or four weeks until it goes away. So be careful what you're doing. Take your time. Make sure the bit is tight. Don't hit this with a hammer or anything. To, to, we don't want to bend anything. The drill bit's in the machine. It's solid. All right. The drill press has a hole in the table here that the drill bit is supposed to go through. Okay. The tables on the drill presses are movable up and down. So depending on what you're drilling, you can get it in there, all right? Drills are, 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 you think they're safe or whatever. You can get hurt on a drill press really quick too, all right? All right. Now when we're drilling stuff, we always put a piece of wood on the drill press to support the back side of whatever we're drilling. I can hold this safely with my hand. I'll show you what to do when you can't do that. Drilling through both pieces of wood here, just to show you something. The back of this one that wasn't su supported by the piece of wood behind it, see it looks like a bullet came through there, and the back of this one that was supported by that, it's nice and clean, smooth hole. So that's why we put a piece of wood underneath what we're drilling. So when the drill bit goes through it, it's not going to look like that. And if you do that on your project, you're going to have all these nasty holes where you could have had a nice clean hole like that by doing a simple little trick. Okay. If you're drilling stuff that's small like this, you certainly don't want to hold it in your hand on this machine because as soon as the drill bit grabs it, it's going to rip it out of your hand. This thing's going to start turning like a saw blade stuck to this drill press and it's spinning around. And by being, you're shaking your head, you've had it happen to you, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, me too. You know, and this thing's sharp on the edge, just going to tear it up hell out of your hand okay so how do you do that well we've got numerous ways to clamp things we have clamps like this which somehow you can 
get in here and clamp it down and, and, and we have C clamps like this which can go in here and, and clamp down and, and, and work relatively well. I can move this over to the side like so, set it up and hopefully not drill through the hole and the, miss the, hit the table around it. Or we can use the drill press vise which is what we keep down under the drill press which you'll get a lot of use out of for this project. We have to lower this down to get the vise into the machine. And it's very heavy, all right? Don't drop it on your foot. It's very heavy. If you're using this, pick it up with two hands, put it on the machine, get it stabilized on there before you try and move anything around. Make sure it's not going to bounce, bounce off. This can be bolted to the machine if we have to. For the most part, for things we're doing, it's sure its weight will hold it on the machine, okay? This is good for if you're drilling something small like this, bang, I could put it in the press like so and clamp it down like so. And I can even drill through the edge of it if I have to, just like that. I guess I'll turn it so the camera can see. Okay. This drill press has the capability, if I want to have all the holes, if I want to have all the holes the same depth, I can set the little guide here to make each hole, which you, some of you may say, how can I make all the holes the same depth? So I'll set this little thing, and every time I drill a hole now, it's going to be the same depth. All right. One, two, so I don't even have to measure each time I'm drilling. Each time it goes through, they're exactly the same depth, which can be very handy for what you're going to be doing. This one I didn't. See, it's deeper. This one's that deep, whereas these are only that deep. Amazing. Okay. All right. Now, as I mentioned before, don't take the drill bit out until it's cool. If you're drilling through metal, the drill bit's obviously going to get hotter because it's more friction metal going through metal than wood. But you let this cool down, okay? Take it out, put it back into the drill. If you're using a hand drill like this, okay, make sure you unplug the machine from the wall before you Put the drill bit in it because if you don't, you're liable to hit the switch. Hit that switch, this thing's going to go on and you're going to be a mess. So unplug the drill from the wall before you put the drill bit in it. This drill has what's called a keyless chuck. It has a, a little metal, metal collar here and a rubber one here. You hold the silver one and turn the black one, and that's what tightens the drill bit into the machine. There's no key like this that goes on it. A little thing that I neglected to mention to you a second ago. This key is on a chain, and so obviously we don't want this thing to be stuck in here when we turn this thing on. So it has a little pin, a spring-loaded pin in the end of it, so it won't stay in the machine. See? Every time you put it in, when you finish it, automatically pops itself out. Whereas the other drill press, you don't have to turn the camera around, but the other drill press on the other side of the room does not have that little spring-loaded pin, so it will not pop out. So it's possible, hang on one second, if you don't remove that key physically from the drill press, it could be a problem. Question? Yeah, what's the point of doing the holes, how you were doing it on the same measurement? Ah. Where would that come from? You, did you ever have a tinker toy when you were a kid? Probably not. None of you guys had tinker toys. <laughs> you did! Tinker toy. You remember, you take your, your tinker toy. I keep on taking those like that. There. And say this was round. And, and you drill, there were holes drilled, and you have all these little pins and dowels. That's the one way to make a gear. You know, like it's a round thing, and it has little sticks sticking out of it, and then it turns and it like knocks this one and knocks that one. So that's where you could drill in the edge of the thing all the same holes. Cool, huh? And you'll see somebody trying that in this thing, you know. Somebody go, oh man, I can do that. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. So that's how you can drill the 
the, the edges of something all the same depth, you know? Or maybe you might have another design you're building on the thing or a piece that'll make something operate, and you need all the holes the same size. That's just what that's about. And, and you couldn't see really where you are, how to set it. I'll show you how to do it, you know. We'll, we'll show you all the fine little things on these machines when you're actually working, when we're working on this thing hands-on for the project. Sir? Does it have, a, like, measurements that you can see? Yeah, it does. It says, it says well, it has inch and millimeters, and okay. that's a... Uh, I'm not real, I've never even, to be perfectly honest, used this part of the measuring. I've done my measuring with something else, a ruler, or just by, I know they need to be that long, so I'll, I'll make a mark, you know. This is accurate, I'm sure. It doesn't have numbers on it. 10 millimeters, 20. Yeah, good, good, good point. All right. Yeah. Okay. Chair, let me get a chair. Don't do what I had a kid doing. I can say kid because I'm an old guy now. But sitting there with his drill and got his drill, he's got his drill bit in the drill and he's going great guns and he's got this thing plugged in up here and he's sitting there in the stool and he's got the drill and he's holding the board and he's drilling through like this, you know? <laughs> Come on, you know? <laughs> Not a good thing. Work on the table, you know? Work on the table. Don't drill holes in the table. There's millions of holes in the table. We fill all the holes. You know, clamp things down to the table if you have to work on a table. Here's a clamp. You can clamp it like this to hold it so it doesn't move. In these tables, there's, you can show over here with your camera. This is for working. Put it in here like so. You can nail and hammer and whatever, cut and stuff. Very handy things on the tables. There's one here, there's you know, all around the tables. Secure things so they don't move out of your way and become dangerous, all right? If you don't see something you need, ask us. We've got it somewhere. We got big clamps, long clamps, heavy clamps, all different kind of clamps. Clamps, clamps, clamps. Okay. So I was mentioned earlier a little bit about air tools. This is an air tool, this is an air tool, this is an electric tool. These two tools do the same thing. This is a jitterbug sander for doing fine finished sanding. The electric machine, you plug it into the wall and it does its job and makes a lot of noise and uh, <coughs> Counterpart of it looks just like that to operate that. Uh, can you see over here? Yeah, you can see yeah. through here with the camera. There's a on this, this is an air station. There's one here, one at the other end of the table. There's one there. They're all around the shop, inside, outside. This operates the air compressor system in the building. The air compressor is outside in a room. The pipes go through the building. The air is developed, delivered through these pipes to the hoses. This one's nice on a, a, a reel. Okay. All the stations have a female end, which is the hose, the male end on the, on the air tool. Pull the little collar back, locks into place, it's in there. You can energize the system by turning the handle parallel with the pipe. Parallel with the pipe is on. 90 degrees perpendicular to the pipe. Is on. The air went out because I shut the handle off. So this is a nice handy little drill. You can get in compact places with it, okay? A lot more so than its electric counterpart, which is big and bulky. All right. Air sander, the same thing. Good for doing surfaces and such. We have to be careful with air tools that we oil them, because if you don't, condensation will get inside of the tool. You'll see it says on the machine right there, it says oil daily. That means that, that in the process of compressing air with the air compressor, it develops condensation inside the tank where the air is stored and pumped up to pressure and in the lines. So on each air station, there's a filter and a water separator which traps water to keep it from going inside the machine. The machine gets water inside, it'll rust from the inside out, rendering the machine useless. Okay. So that's important. They all say oil daily. Air tools all have a capacity of amount of air you put into them. 
This machine says 90 PSI, okay? Some are 80 PSI. We keep these regulators on the air station set for 80 pounds because if you put 150, 200 pounds of air into a machine like this, it'll blow up like a hand grenade, all right? Because it can't hold that much air. So each station has a regulator. We keep them adjusted to 80 pounds, all right? When you shut off the air compressor, should you, when you shut it off, should you waste the rest of the hose? Yeah, it, yeah it's good to bleed it out, yeah. And you can do that two ways. You can keep the machine hooked up to it, just to show you. Like that, I can bleed it out that way if I want to. Or if I don't, if I disconnect this, I can wrap the hose back up. This has a double hose on it, so it's a little awkward. and I'll shut the air off and on the bottom of the water separator you can't see it from where you are but it's there a little rubber knob nipple some of them might have a little handle they're different stations and that's bleeding the air out of the system too so we should do that before we hand it off yeah it's a good idea to get the air out of it that means this isn't energized and pressurized and putting stress on it and, and also somebody may want this off when you know you want to have this dead when you're plugging into it initially to make sure there's not a problem with the machine so it's a good idea to bleed the air out of it first good question yeah uh, yes sir you said something about oiling the, the is it the machine or is it the, con, the, the machine the machine uh, we've got some oil cans around uh, with a little lightweight oil or even wd-40 spray right in that hole just to get some loop it's inside here some machines, we don't keep them on the machine. They have an oil trap. In industri industry, you know, an industrial shop, they're working with these things 24-7, you know. I mean, they got to keep them all lubricated all the time, you know. And here we... Should we spray before we use it or after? It's a good idea to spray them before, you know. You don't want it coming out so the machine's greasy and slippery. You just want a couple drops inside, you know, that's all. And it, and it takes care of that. All right. Any other questions? Can you demonstrate how it's... Like I can. Yep. Picking up where we left off to lubricate the inside of a pair tool. We get a couple of drops into the eyedropper and oil it right into the little hole, just like so. It'll go right into the turbine. When it turns on, it'll spin it and it'll lubricate the inside of the machine. And this is specially designed special oil just for doing this purple air tool oil right on there. <laughs> stay lube air tool oil. it's what I use on my tools <laughs> is it sponsored yes there okay so that being said any questions about anything I've showed you so far